I've been passionate about Sierra Leone for as long as I can remember. Uh, I've been involved um, in charities since university days. Um, I got involved in Ebola, set up a not-for-profit, um, helping working with children. And Shireen, I'm pretty sure you've been to Battersea Park for one of our 5K runs. We used to do sponsored runs um, in, in, in the early days from 1999 uh, to, well, until probably in the mid-2000s. Um, and then I also have been investing in business with my husband, building what will be the first true five-star hotel in Sierra Leone. In the midst of all of this, Ebola happened. And I found myself unable to watch from the sidelines. I stepped forward to get involved, um, to, be, to volunteer and to be part of the response. Uh, and that led to me packing my bags and getting on a plane on the 13th of November, 2014, for what I thought was a three month period. The app did not end until the 7th of November, 2015. I was here for a year um, and that in that year and with the work that we did, it resulted in me being asked to stay on and support the post Ebola recovery program of the president and of the government. Um, when you vested so much and you can see that you have an opportunity to make a difference, you do. You step forward and that could mean leaving a lot behind that you hadn't really bargained for. 18 months into that experience, I saw again with elections for mayor coming up that a lot of the challenges that I have described earlier on stemming from rural urban migration are then compounded if they exist within a context of poor systems or maybe non-existent systems um, and perhaps a lack of a comprehensive, clear intersectoral plan to deal with not just some of the underlying causes, which you may not be able to address as a city, but certainly consequences across sectors such as the environment, transport, housing, sanitation, and health. Um, so it was seeing that opportunity while seeing the devastating impact of deforestation and poor waste management and having some friends kind of prod me along um, that led to the decision that I made in about May, 2017 to run for office the following year, having never been involved in politics prior, having not been a member of a political party and having zero experience of what it would mean to run for office. But I did it, um, and I guess what I proposed to residents of the city that I would seek to deliver resonated, and so I won. Top priorities, environmental management, um, which is goes hand in glove with addressing deforestation and waste management, sanitation. Two, urban planning and housing, um, because that drive, that flow of people, no matter what's done tomorrow, it's already happened today and yesterday. And it's going to take a big investment to see a depopulation of a city. In the meantime, we must improve the standard of living, the quality of life, and the housing provision and access to same for those people, the 35% plus of our residents who are living in slums, informal settlements that have been created along the shore and along the mountain. Failure to impact those people's lives actually guarantees the long-term failure of our city, maybe even the medium-term failure, because we, those natural disasters will continue and they'll be exacerbated. Um, and some of the consequences are just very difficult to reverse. And the third is what I've said is outside of my control. As a city mayor, I'm not investing in jobs, but central government must. 
must invest. We have a government whose manifesto said they were going to build a factory in every district. That would be a good place to start. Create jobs so that there are alternatives and opportunities outside of the city. Freetown the Tree Town is our, is our campaign to not only plant, but grow a million trees in and around the city. We have planted and, and we are growing. And I say grow because we monitor the trees. If you go to um, our tree tracker app, every tree has a unique identifier number. Every tree is tracked in the app. We've planted 557,000 trees. We've just received uh, um, funding through a competition that we won with Bloomberg Global Mayor's Challenge, which will provide us with a million dollars to enable us to plant the next 450 odd thousand trees. And with that, we will also continue our growing program, which means we're creating jobs for young people. Previously, 600 jobs in the direct jobs, because there are also indirect jobs created through the nurseries. Um, for those planted in the first phase. And now with this additional funding, there'll be another 600 or so jobs as we grow and monitor the trees um, for the next three to six years. We're also, we've also developed um, a platform for impact investing, which will in, in eventually lead to us being able to be on the market for carbon offsets. So we're, we're addressing um, that deforestation and we're addressing the water challenges by protecting the catchment areas, by planting on the hillsides, holding that, the roots, the roots holding the soil, reducing uh, um, the runoff and therefore reducing the risk of landslides, planting, regenerating mangroves. But all of this is also still at risk without urban planning and housing. We're working on developing um, a building permit regime um, which is environmentally sensitive, um, a, a local, local area plans for the city. But unfortunately, we will not be able to implement any of this until the government devolves this function to the councils. Morning before I came onto this call, we just launched a waste collection management association of young people who are now waste collectors. So People think garbage collecting, you often think of garbage collecting and you think of your typical big compacted trucks in, in the UK moving from neighborhood to neighborhood with one or two people, um, you know, in the cab, coming out, picking up your garbage and tipping it into the back. Well, for us, waste collection um, was a really significant uh, um, um, problem. And it was one where that system I've just described that you're also familiar with would not have worked. As a result, we had only 21% of solid waste being collected when I, was, when I came to the city. So picture that, 21%, that means 79% of the garbage generated never makes it to a dump site. It's in the community, it's on the streets, it's in waterways. Um, and we set ourselves a challenge to ensure that we increase that from 21% to at least 60% by this year. To do that, we've worked right along the value chain. We've introduced things like the cleanest zone competition in communities. We've introduced um, sanitation patrol. We've introduced enforcement, increased enforcement, working with local communities. But we've also in introduced um, a scheme. And I was down with the young people today which has enabled us to bring on board and create over 1,500 jobs for young people. Our tricycle groups. So we've provided through funding from various donors, EU, uh, uh, um, IOM, Mayor's Regulation Council, at the moment, 120 tricycles. So imagine a motorbike with a cart at the back and three wheels. Um, and that's your garbage collection. And young people taking this up as a business and being able to run it as a business because what the council is doing is providing the enabling environment. In changing our legislation to make it compulsory to, for everyone to have a household waste collector, making it, creating an, an 
app called findmeinfreetown.com where all of these guys are registered and you can sit in your house, go on your phone. And when you put in findme, uh, findmeinfreetown.com, it comes up with your location and a list of who the waste collectors are in your area. So you can link your, be linked very easily to garbage collectors in your area. Um, and this means we've moved from only 3,000 households registered for waste collection because it's not wrapped into your council tax at the moment. That's where we want to get to next year. We've moved from 3,000 to over 50,000 households now registered. So and we now have the streets being swept. And you think, isn't that obvious? Shouldn't streets be swept every day? Well, we didn't have that system. We do now. Um, so through these different interventions, we're creating jobs, we're cleaning our city, and we're meeting our objective collectively as Freetonians to transform Freetown. When we talk about climate change and we talk about um, us actually responding and mitigating, there are two things which we mustn't lose sight of. One is the reality of the consequences of climate change hit us far more than they hit the emitters um, because we don't have the resilience. So when there is heavy rainfall, I mean, I was in the UK in the summer and we drove for a walk down in, where, where did we go? Um, it was somewhere down in Surrey. And, you know, we, we drove through this little village and there was a bit of flooding and the water was coming to our car and it was like, oh, wow, this is happening. And I think that was the same day the train stations flooded or the day, out, day before. But it's gone in a flash. Whereas the consequences of flooding here are much more severe because you don't have the infrastructure to deal with it as well. That's the same way that we saw Germany, China, etc. But you're not talking about that flooding anymore because it's all been dealt with. So the ability to withstand the consequences and the extreme weather impacts when you are, when you are uh, um, subsistence farmers, you have a bad rain. Uh, rain if, if, if you don't have rain when you're supposed to have it, or you have heavy rain when you're not supposed to have it, you could have your farm, your um, crop, your harvest wiped out. And you've got no cushion, you've got no reserve, you've got nothing to lean back on. But significantly as well, Shireen, extreme heat is something we're experiencing in the city now and that is a silent killer those informal settlements i mentioned these slum communities which um, actually account for over 35 percent of our population the housing material for them is corrugated iron it's like it's corrugated iron sheets zinc sheets it's like living in an oven so the health impact is terrible not to mention the smog and the respiratory diseases. So when we talk about climate, and the, we, we don't talk about it because we feel we're the worst emitters. No way. We absolutely are not. We are the victims. We're the victims because the, 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 the global climate impacts are affecting our temperature, um, and that affects health, air pollution. But then on the other hand, we have localized activities which are exacerbating climate action of climate change, which are also devastating for us. In the last, in this last three years, um, there has been more deforestation outside of the city than I believe we've, we've seen in the last 15 or 20 years. So you see Freetown, but if you go up to Kenema or you go to Kabbalah, Kabbalah is experiencing flooding. I mean, Kabbalah used to be cold. Kabbalah is experiencing heat. Um, and there's been a policy which has basically allowed timber um, export all year round. And that has been devastating. So I totally agree with you. And I was on a panel during COP26 where I gave this analogy in terms of the role um, and the responsibility of the global north vis-a-vis -vis the global south when it comes to expenditure for climate action and particularly for climate adaptation, which is required now. Um, and my analogy was, if you have a limousine, a Bentley, and you're going along the M24, M25, and you run into me 
on my bicycle, who should pay the damages? The Bentleys are asking us all to pay for the damage that's being done to their Bentley, but my bike has been crushed and I don't have the resources in the first place. So this conversation was supposed to have been had more concretely and with better outcomes than it was had at COP26. Let's hope that COP27, there's more focus given and more money put on the table to support the countries of the global South whose bicycles have been damaged by Bentleys that they don't own. So almost four years in, um, it will be my, yeah, I'll be celebrating my fourth year as mayor in May, so just a few months from now. Um, I think there's some lessons I've learned um, and some of the things that we did were intuitive coming from my experience during Ebola, coming from my private sector background. Um, and I would say that I feel that the reason for our success, one of the main reasons for our success is the fact that we had a clearly articulated plan with measurable targets and a prioritized agenda and we communicate. So if you wake me up in the middle of the night, I can tell you our 19 targets. And, it, and so you're driven. You're going to have the obstacles. You're going to have the challenges. But if you know where, you're, where you've set your goal to, or what you've set as a goal, where you're going, what you're determined to achieve, then when those challenges come, you may be knocked off a little bit, but you know exactly where you need to go back to to keep moving forward. Uh, and, and going through that process, which was a participatory process um, uh, and which involved a lot of technical input, expert input, that process that we went through when I came into office in May 18, um, through to launching Transform Freetown in January 2019, really provides us with a compass. Um, so I would say, yes, we live in a polarized world, increasingly so very difficult and challenging political landscapes all over the place in all, you know, the, the global North is not I'm excluded from this, but if you're in public office or indeed if you are just an interested uh, um, citizen, be about probably easier for you in public office because you probably have more of a mandate, but even in your own space, maybe in what you do, if you're um, a, a, an NGO or a civil society activist, be clear about what it is you feel you can achieve. In designing Transform Freetown, I often say, we say Transform Freetown, we do believe in transformation, but we know that we're not addressing all the problems. We know we can't possibly in four or five years address all the problems, but we want to make enough of an impact through these pre-agreed 19 targets that we move the needle, that there is a sense that something is different. So be clear about what you want to do and then be like a bulldog in going for it. We definitely have had our challenges and they continue. As I sit here speaking to you, they are very real, but there's also that sense of collective good. As you are consistent, you'll be surprised the dots that become joined, the numbers of people around you who will see the big picture, who will look at what's best for the common good and who will come alongside as you come alongside them. Collaboration, cooperation, hashtag further together. We can do this. Um, with respect to the disadvantaged position of girls, um, which is very real. Um, Sierra Leone was named as one of the worst places to be a girl child, to grow up as a girl um, some years ago. And, and, and it's, it's sad that, you know, a lot, a lot and not enough has changed um, in that regard. Um, you specifically asked about girls who might look up to me. Um, it's come, I, I've become more aware that when I ran for office, 
I was not thinking about it from the perspective of becoming a role model for girls or young women. That wasn't on my radar. Um, it now is because I've realized that inadvertently um, I have provided um, um, a role model and that there are many young women and, and girls, um, including a little four-year-old who came to my office like two years ago, dressed up um, and was, was pretending to be me. She was going to see, she had this program at school. They had to choose a character. She came, didn't have an appointment, but my secretary insisted I see her and I'm so glad I did. I'll send you the video, Shireen. I captured it. It was so sweet. She, um, she read out my whole CV and then she looked at me and she went, who am I? <laughs> it was just delightful. Um, and it's really inspired me to be a bit more deliberate about role modeling. So I will, at the end of um, this month, early February, be launching Yaz Girls Leadership Foundation, um, which is a foundation through which I will very deliberately visit girls in schools. Our, 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 our tagline is give them wings, watch them fly. Um, and what we intend to do is to help speak to girls, coach girls on how they can build their confidence um, and, and fulfill their potential. Um, so that's, yeah, that, that's, that's a little piece of um, a bigger picture that many women are stepping into. And I think the more we do, the more women uh, um, support each other and, and really support uh, womanhood and, and girls in, in Sierra Leone and in Freetown in particular.